handheld around the world. A necessity for gracious living. And what better travel companion when visiting Greece than the legendary Sony PlayStation Portable? While some of us may think this is the case, there is no denying that the handheld gaming market has essentially been completely and utterly dominated by Nintendo for almost as long as there has been a handheld gaming market. From the unrelenting Game Boy and its many iterations to the DS family and beyond, the Big N has pretty much always ruled the portable gaming roost with an iron fist. You could trace this eminence even further, all the way back to the Game & Watch which was Nintendo's first real major success within the gaming industry. In fact, as of today, Nintendo's hybrid handheld home console, the Switch, is not just set to break records and become the best-selling handheld of all time, but the best-selling gaming device that has ever been marketed, period. Nintendo is the undisputed king of the mountain when it comes to all things handheld gaming. However, there was a point in history when their position as handheld kings looked for a short time like it might actually be in jeopardy. The almost unfathomable success of the PlayStation brand had given Sony the confidence to try and take over another corner of the market, and the impressive specs for the machine they had at their disposal made it seem like there was a good chance they were going to do just that. That's right folks, today we're going to be taking a deep dive and examining the successes and failures of Sony's first foray into the dedicated handheld market. I am Lady Decade and this is the rise and fall of the PSP, the handheld that came closer than any other to dethroning Nintendo. Sony's all-conquering and immediately recognisable PlayStation brand went from strength to strength after the release of their first console, the PS1, in December of 1994. The unprecedented success of the disc-based system saw Sony not only cement themselves as a viable alternative in the home video game market, it saw them actually ascend to the top of that market. The PS1 continued to grow in both notoriety and popularity, and all but guaranteed that Sony's upcoming successor to that console would take the gaming world by storm in a similar fashion. That successor came in the form of the PS2, released in March 2000, and it not only matched its predecessor's success, but it only went on to go and bloody exceed it. The PS2 was an absolute phenomenon, and by 2003, Sony and their PlayStation brand were clear market leaders, head and shoulders above the rest of the competition. That wasn't quite enough for the greedy Japanese electronics giants, however, as they looked to expand their gaming dominance even further. So a plan was concocted to finally try to knock Nintendo off their handheld pedestal. On the 13th of May 2003, just one day before that year's E3 event at the Convention Center in Los Angeles, California, Sony CEO Ken Kutaragi took to the stage at a press conference to announce that Sony was soon to be launching a new handheld entertainment platform. Although no designs or hardware were ready to be shown off to the public as of yet, he did reveal that this upcoming system would be called the PSP, or PlayStation Portable. A snappy name indeed. According to Kutaragi himself, the baby is still in the incubator at the moment. Okay. He claimed that this new device would be able to fuse multiple types of entertainment together and would be able to play games, movies and music all on the go. He even went on to claim that the PSP was poised to become, and I quote, the Walkman of the 21st century about Sony's immensely popular and pioneering personal stereo system from the 80s, which was one of their all-time most successful products. 
These were seriously bold claims, but Kotaraki and his posse of Sony badasses were confident they could produce the goods to meet these lofty expectations. After all, their confidence wasn't unwarranted when you consider that the PlayStation 2 is currently still the best selling console of all time, which is at least until the Switch inevitably beats it very soon. Many gaming websites and publications got wind of Sony's imminent new contraption and seemed extremely excited about its technologically impressive array of features and upcoming launch. The only problem, or potential problem, was the rather shaky history non-Nintendo companies have had with releasing handhelds in the past. The closest thing to competition any of the lines of various Game Boys have had during their multiple lengthy reigns of dominance were the Sega Game Gear during the early 90s and the Bandai Wonderswan during the late 90s and early 2000s. Although the Game Gear enjoyed some brief moments of success in both Japan and Europe, the Wonderswan had a fairly substantial fan base in Japan. Neither came even remotely close to matching the sales of Nintendo's handheld phenomenon and both went on to become little more than comparative footnotes in gaming history. Check out the Wonderswan video I filmed last year in Poland if you would like to learn more about that one. Sony had rather smartly, cautiously tested the portable gaming waters with their Japanese exclusive Pocket Station device in 1999, although that wasn't much more than a glorified memory card similar to what Sega did with their Dreamcast VMUs the previous year. Despite the Pocket Station having little functionality, Sony still managed to shift around 5 million of them in Japan, which really speaks volumes as to how popular the electronics company's PlayStation brand truly was. However, the release of the Game Boy Advance in 2001 and subsequent immediately positive fan reaction and super strong sales solidified Nintendo's position at the very top of the market even further. Still, Sony's position in the industry and advanced hardware meant that by mid-2004, independent data group analysts were predicting that the PSP was about to be the first legitimate competitor to Nintendo's dominance in the handheld market. The specs and amount of connectivity and functionality that Sony had promised would put their new PSP well ahead of all of the rest of the competition in terms of technology. They just had to take the next steps in terms of finalising the design and features. It wasn't until November 2003 that any images of the PSP's form were revealed to the public. Sony had mocked up some concept designs which they unveiled at a corporate strategy meeting. But critical reception to these first sets of designs was a worrying mix of muted and concerned which certainly was off-brand for anything connected to PlayStation products. This sort of reaction was mainly due to the lack of any kind of analog stick, which seemed like it would be pivotal to be able to play the types of games Sony had been promising. It also featured completely flat face buttons, which didn't look very appealing and didn't look like they would provide any tactile resistance. Further to this, many were also worried about the form factor of the new handheld, but thankfully Sony had clearly listened to fans and critics, as they went on to reveal the hardware in an official capacity at E3 2004. After the CEO of Sony Entertainment, Kaz Hirai, took to the stage and gave the simple introduction of, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the latest addition to the PlayStation family. The little black bundle of joy was brought up so we could finally see its finished design. Complete with a small analog control stick and conventional face buttons laid out like Sony's other PlayStation controllers, along with a 4.3 inch colour screen in a 16 by 9 widescreen ratio, this seemed to be exactly what Sony fanboys had envisaged the new handheld would look like. Just take my money. 
Confirmed, Cool Kid, Kaz Hidai went on to lord the PSP's video playback ability, showcasing a trailer for the upcoming Spider-Man 2 movie, but also insisted that games would be the main focus of the system, going on to highlight several upcoming releases from several of the top-line, highly appealing, massive roster of developers that they had already got on board. Almost 100 devs had signed up before the PSP was even ready to go to market, and some of the games being promised were almost mouth-watering. Seriously, this was one of the most impressive and tantalising console reveals to date. The PSP would also be slated to include several other features, such as the use of a proprietary multimedia disc format known as Universal Media Discs, or UMDs. These swanky little fellows could store up to 1.8 gigabytes of data and would be used to play both games and full-length licensed movies via the PSP's integrated disc drive. The UMDs were basically a miniaturised optical disc encased in a plastic protective covering, capable of storing games, music or video, typically encoded in a 720x480 resolution, although that resolution would be downscaled somewhat to fit the PSP's Diddy screen. The discs were small enough that they would not be intrusive when inserted into a handheld device, but also memory intensive enough that they could match the capacity of CD-based home consoles of the day. The plastic covering would serve the purpose of providing much-needed stability to the disc readers when the device was in motion, to prevent skipping and games from crashing and whatnot. Or that was the theory, at least. At less than half the size of a regular CD or DVD, this new format was extremely impressive for the time and was seen as a huge triumph for Sony. Almost equally impressive was the PSP's proposed ability to be able to play MPEG-4 and other coding, with DVD image quality combined with connectivity with both your home computer and your PS2. This level of interactive connectivity was absolutely unheard of in 2003 and was way, way in advance of anything that any other portable gaming devices were offering. To put it simply, Sony were light years ahead of the pack. The graphical specs of the hardware were equally as spectacular and forward thinking, with capabilities that would almost be on par with home consoles of the time. Critics and consumers alike were frenzied with anticipation for Sony's new handheld, and on October the 17th of 2004, when Sony announced that the PSP base model would be launching in Japan in December of that year, the hype grew even more. The Sony PlayStation Portable was launched to schedule in Japanese stores on the 12th of December 2004 for the rather reasonable fee of just under 20,000 yen for the base model, which was about 180 US dollars, or when adjusted for inflation, around 278 US dollars in today's future money. There was also a premium package available for 24,800 yen, known as the PSP Value System, which included several extras such as a 32 megabyte memory stick duo and various useful accessories. Sales were strong right from the off, with over 200,000 units being purchased on the very first day of release. The PSP was off to an extremely promising start, so the next step in Sony's plan for world handheld domination was to release the system to the good old US of A. They announced the PSP's American launch on the 24th of March and its price of $249 all on the 3rd of February 2005 to the press. Some showed concern over the price increase compared to the Japanese launch, or the fact that there was no budget model on offer, as Sony would only be selling one variant. There was one far bigger concern, however, a split-screened Nintendo-developed concern. Yes, that's right, those dastardly scoundrels over at Nintendo had beaten Sony to the punch by several months, and had already released their new touchscreen handheld, the dual screen, or DS, 
to American stores in November of 2004. Although the DS was vastly inferior to the PSP in terms of graphical ability, functionality and connectivity, this was still terrible news for Sony, not least because the DS had already sold close to 3 million units worldwide by the end of 2004. To compound matters even further, not only did Nintendo now already have a huge install base before the PSP had even hit store shelves, but the DS was also a full $100 cheaper than its Sony counterpart. That's two fifths of its total price. Ouch. Although consumers were initially skeptical of the high price point, reviews were extremely positive, and it seemed that once early adopters got their hands on Sony's new bit of kit and saw what it could do, they felt like the $250 they shelled out was a worthy investment. Sales were looking pretty good, with Sony reportedly shifting 500,000 PSPs in the first two days after its launch, which does sound impressive. But the lofty ambitions and high expectations caused by so many years of PlayStation success meant that this was actually significantly lower than what they had hoped for or anticipated. Things looked more hopeful for the PSP in PAL regions, with the system enjoying some of its strongest success in Europe. Sony did intend to have simultaneous North American and PAL launches, but had to hold back on the European release after they struggled to meet the demand for the handheld from US customers. When the PSP finally did hit store shelves across PAL regions on the 1st of September 2005, Sony managed to offload 185,000 units to UK customers on launch day, with all stock being completely sold out within three hours of its release. This actually doubled the previous UK first day sales records set by Nintendo's DS system just months earlier. The UK would go on to become one of Sony's biggest strongholds for the PSP, but the system actually sold more than 1 million units across all of Europe in its first week of sales. Not bad going at all. Some cynical people have suggested that Sony's excuse of not being able to meet demands in America was merely a ploy to justify delaying the PSP's European release to intentionally build hype for the device. But I'm fairly sure there have never been any such unscrupulous or dishonest acts carried out by anyone in the video game industry, so that surely can't be true. Absolutely not. Given the impressive processing power of the PSP, particularly compared to all other handhelds on the market, there was a huge scope for being able to play all sorts of games on the system, including ones that could potentially rival or match big budget home console experiences. The impressive array of 24 games available right from day one, including entries from Wipeout, Ape Escape, Ridge Racer, FIFA, Metal Gear Solid and a Tony Hawk's franchise, made the PSP an immediate hit with critics, PlayStation fans and hardcore gamers alike. The Pretty Little Portable Powerhouses library continued to grow to include a dizzying mix of reboots and remakes, collections, compilations, original titles, franchise big hitters, sports games, puzzle games, novelty games and everything in between. In fact, there was over 1,370 officially released games in total and truly one of the most diverse and varied libraries out there. Unfortunately, impressive specs, impressive functionality and an impressive game library were just no match for Nintendo and their pesky little split-screen nuisance. And the DS was beginning to vastly outsell the PSP in all markets. 
despite Sony's little powerhouse gaining a very brief advantage over the DS immediately after release. A combination of unyielding Game Boy inspired brand loyalty and a tantalizing amount of third party support meant Nintendo's latest handheld had taken a huge lead quicker than you could say, it's a me, Mario. There were several other factors at play in the PSP's fall from grace. Unreliable units that would often break down due to all of the internal moving parts. The sudden rise of other portable multimedia platforms. Overly expensive proprietary memory cards that you literally had to buy. Faulty lasers and fragile UMD discs. But it can't be understated how much damage the DS did to Sony as a handheld manufacturer. At around 80 million units sold, there's no way the PSP could be considered an outright failure. It held a strong position in the market for several years with an impressive and critically acclaimed library of games. The thing is, given the weight that the PlayStation brand carried and how much money Sony pumped into the PSP, that was nowhere near good enough for them, and only selling 50% as many units as their main competitor definitely wasn't good enough either. The PSP was insanely ahead of its time and is still extremely playable today, and is rightly remembered incredibly fondly by many gamers that enjoyed the system the first time around. It's a shame that it had to compete with one of the biggest selling pieces of video game hardware of all time, as things might have been very different for Sony's debut handheld in an alternative timeline when Nintendo decided to release the Virtual Boy 2 instead. Uh, if only. Regardless of beating Nintendo or not, apart from featuring a quality library of games, nearly two decades on, the PSP still sits proudly amongst many games collections due to how easy it is to soft mod, making it an ideal piece of hardware for handheld emulation. However you choose to use it today, there is no denying that this beast made some sort of splash. So I am Lady Decade and that was the rise and fall of the Sony PSP, the closest any handheld has ever come to beat Nintendo. Now if you enjoyed today's video be sure to like it, subscribe and ring that notification bell to ensure that you never miss one of my uploads. Videos like this are in part made possible due to the generous support that I receive via Patreon. Speaking of whom, a special thanks go out to... William J. Scott III, Carl Thomas, Sebastian Velez, House of the Ted, Boyd Chan, Big Papa Pickles, J. O'Malley Drone, T. Bo Baggins, Sir Landry Does Gaming, Christopher Divieo, Richard Turnbull, Green Cooper, Frank 1982, Eric Hendricks, UK Kraut Gaming, Anthony Ryan Bennett, Brent O'Hara, Stephen Quinn, Autumn Breeze, Timothy Hansmer, Ryan Dacker, Dizzy Koala, Sandbox Larry, Awesome Jacket Dude, Triforce of Shadows, Johnny Holly, OPC, EmuMovies.com, PWND Games, Consoles, Accessories, Corey Uderkirk, Ben Harradine, Gasper Heller, Sedgmeister, and Ago as well as all of the rest of my lovely patrons. Thank you all so much. <laughs>